Hello student friends, this is Professor R.M. Mahindrakir, JSS Arts, Science and Commerce College, Gokak. In the last class, we had seen the morphological and anatomical adaptations in hydrophytic plants. Today, we will be studying about the morphological and anatomical adaptations in xerophytes. So what are xerophytes? Xerophytes are the plants which grow in dry habitat or xeric conditions, places where water is not present adequately. All such habits are called xeric habits and the plants growing in such xeric habits are called as xerophytes. Xerophytic habits may be of following types. Because whenever we think of xerophytic uh, or xeric habitat, it means that we feel as if there is no water itself. Actually, it is not that way. There are different types of xeric habitats. Now, let us see about that. The habitat physically dry, that is the places like desert, rock surface, wasteland, etc. These form one type of uh, the xeric habitat. The second xeric habits, we call them as habitats that are physiologically dry. That is places where water is present in excess amount, but it is not such as can be absorbed by the plant easily. Such habitats may be too salty or too acidic, too hot or too cold. That is why we see though typha is a hydrophyte, it does develop certain xerophytic characters. Then the third xeric habitat is the habitats that are dry physically as well as physiologically. Now example of such habitat are the slopey areas. Example, the slopes of the mountain. Xerophytes, when growing under unfavorable condition, this plant develops certain structural and physiological character characteristics which aim mainly at the following objectives. First, to absorb as much as water as possible the moment they get it. Second, to retain the water in their organ for a very long time. Third, to reduce the rate of transpiration so that they can conserve the water and to check high consumption of water. Xerophytes are characterized into several groups according to their drought resisting power. These groups are as follows. Drought escaping plants. I mean, these are the plants which have a very short life period and during the dry conditions, they survive in the form of seeds and fruits which are hard and resistant. As the conditions become favorable, the seeds germinate into a new sized plant and complete their life cycle within again the advent of the dry conditions. So such plants we call them as drought escaping plants. The examples of drought escaping plants are these uh, papillionates, uh, some inconspicuous compositae like uh, the artemisid, and members of the family zygophilaceae, boraginaceae, and some grasses. The second types are these drought enduring plants. These are small size plants which have capacity to endure or tolerate drought conditions. The third are the drought resistant plants. These plants develop certain adaptive features in them through which they can resist extreme drought conditions. Xerophytes grow on a variety of habitat. Some grow on 
rocky soil, so we call them as lithophytes. Some grow in deserts, we call them as uh, samophytes. And some grow on wasteland, we call them as eremophytes. Some plants of xeric habitat have water storing fleshy organs, while some do not develop such structures. Based upon this, we have classified the xerophytes into two groups. One are the succulent xerophytes, and the second are the non succulent xerophytes. The succulent xerophytes are those plants in which some organs become swollen and fleshy due to active accumulation of water in them or in other words the bulk of the plant body is composed of water storing tissues. Water stored in these tissues is consumed during the period of extreme drought while the soil becomes depleted of available water. Examples are this aloe, then we have even this opuntia. Okay, so these are some of the examples of these succulent xerophytes. The non succulent xerophytes are those plants whose plant organs are not swollen due to accumulation of water. The plant organs are usually hard, leathery, and flat. Examples of non succulent plants are these uh, date palms toddy palm, then we have this uh, casuarina. So in order to survive in such harsh conditions, the xerophytic plants develop certain features. And these features we summarize under the following heads. Morphological adaptations, that is the external adaptations, the adaptations that are visible to our eyes. Now just look at the image towards your left. You'll see so many xerophytic plants there. And you just observe all the features that we see there. And its detail we'll be explaining in further slides. The second is the anatomical adaptations. I mean, these are the internal adaptations. Means what type of tissues, how the tissues are distributed within the plant to conserve water and then the physiological adaptations. So now first let us study the different morphological adaptations. First we'll start with the root system. The root system in xerophytes is profusely branched. Now you can just see the image towards the left side here. There you can see one agave plant. You see the amount of growth of the shoot and the root. The roots are so profusely branched that they are superficial because most of the xerophytes they try to conserve as much as water possible and whatever the water that is available in the superficial layer of the earth they have to absorb it. Hence the roots are mostly superficial and highly branched. Then the root hairs are densely developed near the growing tips of the rootlets. And the roots of perennial xerophytes, they grow very deep into the earth and reach the layer where the water is available in plenty. The second morphological adaptation is seen in the stem. Now in xerophytes, we see wide variety of adaptations in the stem. And this we shall see one by one. Now in equisitum, the surface of the stem is covered with a thick coat of wax and silica. This protects the plant from desiccation. So also in the case of this calotropis plant, you can observe here that the leaves and the stem, they are covered with the dense fine hairs or even in most of the cases, it will be covered with the waxy layer. Then in some xerophytes, 
uh, the stem becomes very hard and woody. Now this is the most common uh, xerophyte which is grown as an ornamental plant. Now you can see the stem is subterranean. That is the stem remains always under the soil and only the shoot system emerges out. And though the stem remains under the soil, it is hard and woody. Then in this uh, date palms and toddy palms, the hard and woody stem is aerial. Then in some plants like this uh, clenia articulata, which is also called as the bonsai plant, here the stem becomes swollen and bulbous and fleshy. And it appears as if the leaves are arising directly from the root. But this is the stem. You see how swollen it has become. And so this is one of the adaptation. That is, it is a succulent xerophyte. So the there is a water storage tissue in the stem here. That is the reason why it becomes bulbous and fleshy. Then in plants like this uh, Duranta and Ulex, the stem is modified into thorns. Now whatever the sharp pointed thorny structures you are seeing here, actually this is a stem. These are not the leaves. The stem is modified into thorns here and this prevents the plant from undergoing excess rate of transpiration and thus it helps in conservation of water. Then in some other xerophytes like this uh, Cocoloba or Mulambrachia, the stem becomes flat and green in color and performs the function of the leaf that is photosynthesis. So whatever the flat green structure you are seeing here, actually it is a stem. And this stem consists of many nodes and internodes. Hence, such a modification of stem, we call it as phylloclade. Then in case of ruscus, the stem becomes a flat leaf-like. Actually, these leaf-like structures, these are not the leaves. They are the stem. And it is a stem because it contains this uh, nodal region. And at this nodal region, you can see the uh, flower blooming here. Because in the leaves, we don't see any nodes and internodes. But because here there is a nodal region on this leaf-like structure, so this leaf-like structure is a stem. And such flattened leaf-like structures and such a condition where the stem becomes a flat green leaf-like structure, we call that type of stem modification as cladophils. Then in asparagus plant, the stem, which consists of a single internode, becomes green and performs the function of photosynthesis. So phylloclade contains many nodes and internodes, whereas this cladode, it works like a phylloclade only, but it consists of a single internode. Now here you can see whatever these uh, fine pointed green structures you are seeing here, these are all actually a stem of a single internode. So we call these as these uh, cladodes, which is very common in asparagus plant. Now we shall see the modifications in the leaf. Leaves are generally reduced to scales as in this casuarina and rascus. Now whatever the green thing you are seeing here, this is the stem. And these at the nodal region, you can see fine brownish colored 
scale like leaves and this is very clearly seen in this enlarged image now you can see actually these are the leaves the leaves are become fine scale like and thus this plant helps in reducing the rate of transpiration then in case of this uh, xerophytic plant like uh, pinus the leaf is modified into fine needle shape because in most of the xerophytes we'll see that the leaf lamina is highly reduced because the more broader the leaf is the more higher will be the rate of transpiration the small the more smaller the leaf size is the less will be the rate of transpiration In a leaf succulents like aloe, the leaves swell remarkably and become very fleshy owing to the storage of excess amount of water and latex in them. The plant with succulent leaves generally developed reduced stem. Examples of leaf succulents are this aloe, then we have this uh, Clinia phycoides and several members of the family Chinopodiaceae. Then in majority of xerophytes, the leaves are generally much reduced and are provided with thick cuticle and dense coating wax of silica. Sometimes they become reduced to spines as you can see in this uh, Opuntia plant. Whatever the sharp pointed spines you are seeing, actually those are the leaves which are modified into spines. The other examples of the plants where the leaves are modified into spines are this Ulex, Euphorbia, Caparis, and Acacia. Generally, the leaves of xerophytic species possess reduced leaf blades and have very dense network of veins. In this plant that is Babul, that is Australian Acacia, the pinnae are shed before the ratches and the green petiole swells and becomes flattened, taking the shape of the leaf. This modified petiole, we call it as phyllod. The phyllod greatly reduces the water loss, stores excess amount of water and performs the process of photosynthesis. In some xerophytes, especially those growing well exposed to strong wind and here the undersurface of the leaves are covered with thick hairs which protect the stomatal guard cells and check the rate of transpiration. These xerophytes which have hairy covering on the leaves and the stems are known as trichophilus plants and the condition is known as trichophily. Trichophily is commonly seen in this Zizippus, Nerium, Calotropis, etc. Now we shall discuss about the anatomical adaptations in xerophytes. A number of modifications develop internally in the xeric plants and all aim at the water economy. The following are the anatomical peculiarities we observe in xerophytes. First, heavy cutanization. Second, compact and multilayered epidermis. Epidermal hairs. Sunken stomata compact and thick-walled hypodermis and ground tissue modifications. Now first let us study each of these taking an example of a non-succulent stem that is casuarina. Now this is a transverse section of a casuarina stem. It is a non-succulent xerophyte. 
Now here you can see the epidermis is highly cutinized with and you can see just below the epidermis we are having this multi-layered epidermis and also this clarencomatous hypodermis and just below that we are having this colencomatous hypodermis. Now here the stem as I have told you in casuarina the stem is a modified phylloclade so it has to perform the process of photosynthesis hence the hypodermis is chlorocolencomatous contains the chloroplast so that is why we call this as a chlorocolencomatous hypodermis and it helps in the process of photosynthesis so and you just observe observe the hypodermal cells the cells are compactly arranged there are colon comatose cells and in between here you can see the stomatas the stomatas are sunken because the stem is taking the function of photosynthesis it has to exchange the gases that is during the daytime it has to give out oxygen and take in carbon dioxide and in the night it has to take in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide so this exchange of gases is facilitated by the stomata so stomatas are necessary but the stomatas are not superficial here they are sunken deep now you can see this is the region where the stomatas are present and in this stomatal cavities we have these hairs and these hairs actually maintain artificial humidity so thereby reducing the rate of transpiration and the ground tissue also you see it is very compact here and the xylem is very well developed so all these are some of the most important xerophytic characters which we see in casuarina plant or in all the non-succulent xerophytes now another example we shall see it in the leaf now this is a transverse section of the nerium leaf now here you can see now this is a highly cutinized epidermis the epidermis is multi-layered the mesophyll cells are compactly arranged without any intercellular spaces so these are some of the important features because if the intercellular spaces are more then the rate of evaporation and accumulation of water vapor will be more and rate of transpiration also increases but when the cells are compactly arranged okay so the rate of evaporation will be automatically reduced and thus the rate of transpiration is reduced just like when you spread a cloth and hang it it gets dried up easily but when you keep the cloth in a clump and then keep it you will see that it remains wet for a longer time so the same case here the cells are compactly in the rate of evaporation will be very slow and hence the rate of transpiration also will be very slow that is why in all the xerophytic plants you will see that especially in the leaves also the mesophyll tissue will be compactly arranged and then here also you see the stomatas are restricted only to the lower epidermis and the stomatas are sunken now these are the sunken stomatas here and then again here also you will be seeing that the cavity shows presence of these hairs now we shall take another example of a non succulent xerophyte that is pinus needle section and observe the different types of anatomical peculiarities when you take a transverse section of a pinus needle in pinus monophylla it appears to be circular in pinus sylvestris it will appear semicircular and in pinus roxburghi it will appear triangular in outline and here the image that we are seeing is of a transverse section of a pinus needle belonging to pinus rosbergi the outermost layer is the epidermis which consists of thick walled cells it is 
covered by a very strong cuticle. Many sunken stomata are present on the epidermis. Each stomata opens internally into a substomatal cavity and externally into a respiratory cavity or vestibule. Below the epidermis are present a few layers of thick walled sclerenchymatous hypodermis. It is well developed at the ridges. Here we see the mesophyll is surrounded by a hypodermal sheath of sclerenchyma from all the sides. This sheath forms a diaphragm against intense light. Such xerophytes in which sclerenchyma is extensively developed are called sclerophyllous plants. Whereas the example that we had seen earlier that is in Narium, the leaf, did not show any sclerenchymatous hypodermis. So they are all non-sclerophyllous plants. In between the hypodermis and endodermis is present the mesophyll tissue. Each cell of the mesophyll tissue are polygonal and filled with chloroplast. Many peg-like infoldings or cellulose also arise from the inner side of the wall of mesophyll cells. We can also see few resin canals present in the mesophyll tissue adjoining the hypodermis. Their number is variable, but greatly they are two in number. Endodermis is single layered with barrel shaped cells and clear Casparian strips. A single vascular bundle is placed medianally in case of Pinus wallichinia and two vascular bundles are seen in the Spinus rosbergi at an angle. On the basis of one or two vascular bundles, the needle of the pine can be divided into haploxylon or diploxylon. Usually, sunken stomata are commonly seen in diploxanol variety and in haploxylon only in few pinus plants we see sunken stomata. Now we shall see the anatomical peculiarities in succulent stem and leaves. In succulent stem and leaves, ground tissue are filled with thin walled parenchymatous cells which store excess amount of water, mucilage, latex, etc. This makes the stem swollen and fleshy. Now here in the image you can see when you take a section you will see a slime coming out that is nothing but the mucilaginous sheath in case of this aloe leaf. In succulent leaves, the spongy parenchyma develops extensively which stores water and mucilage. Here also you will see there is a single layered epidermis consists of compact layer in cells. Hypodermis is present here. Then here also you can see this clarenchymatous sheath surrounding the vascular bundle here. And then in the center you will see large quantity of hypodermal, large quantity of parenchymatous cells which extensively store water in form of mucilage or latex. So, here we conclude this topic on the xerophytic adaptations, both morphological and anatomical adaptations we have seen in all the xerophytic plants. So, thank you for your time. Please take care of your health, be safe, wear mask whenever you go out of your house and take maximum precautions. Thank you.